Hello. First of all, I'd like to say thank you very much for inviting me to speak today about sustainability, and yes, it's a thing. So there's lots of definitions of sustainability, and some of them are a, pa are a page long, or at least many paragraphs. But if you sort of think about the global trend for one moment and just think about sustainability, it is the ability to exist constantly. So just keep that in your mind as a very simple definition of sustainability. And then a little bit more on that is that we shouldn't use up everything we have today that will also be needed by the people of tomorrow. That's the essence of sustainability and making sure that we're practising it so that we will have the things needed by the people of tomorrow. Now, typically, organisations or any sort of uh, group will start measuring sustainability and it tends to go under three main pillars. The three P's, you might have heard of them, or the triple bottom line, which is people, planet and profit. What's people? Well, people is making sure that basic human rights are met, that communities are thriving and doing well. It means that people are getting paid properly. It means that they work in a safe environment. What about planet? Well, planet is making sure that we're using all of our raw materials, our land, our water and our energy in an efficient way. Then economic, profit. Well, that is about economic growth without negatively impacting on the other two. So, what if you take one of these things away and have a kind of an unbalanced tricycle? If you have people and profit, well, you get temporary equity, temporary equity. If you have people and planet, but no dough, then that's temporarily bearable. If we have cash and planet, that's just viable, temporarily viable. To get the lot, we need all three to make sure that we're sustainable. So that's a primer about sustainability. Now I want to go into your kitchen. Does anyone here own a fridge that might look a bit like this one? No one. Okay, imagine you own a refrigerator. <laughs> Tough crowd. Imagine you own a refrigerator and if you do, have you ever had it left open by mistake? But mm, yes, we remember those days, don't we? By mistake for all kinds of different reasons. So I want you to just put yourself in that position. And this idea was lent to me by a young man called Sam Brown, who's CEO of LiveCore, as I was having a 30 second conversation with him in the MLA building last week. He said, talk about a fridge. So that's why I'm doing this. And there's some other good reasons why I'm doing it. So the fridge is left open. What happens when your fridge is left open, say overnight, or you've gone away for a holiday? What happens with your cash situation? We got a mic. No one knows. <laughs> got to replace stuff. What? What do you need to replace? You spoil the fridge. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go straight to the good, good, good guys, shall we? No. <laughs> well, how does it impact the profitability of your home? The fridge is open. It smells. Yeah, I'm thinking kind of cashola now. So, okay, I'll give you a hint. Um, perhaps the food has gone off and you have to throw it away and buy some more food. Yep. What about your power bill? What happens when a fridge is left open? Does the rest of the room just cool down or does it heat up? It heats up. It heats up. Thank you, Bindi. Bindi knows the first law of thermodynamics, <laughs> which is what? There's no free lunch. That's what Lord Kelvin said. You might have heard of the Kelvinator fridge, yeah? So that law is you can't create or destroy energy. It's just going to go from one place to the next. So as the fridge is left open, what happens? 
well, the compressor keeps working because it the thermostat's wanting it to meet a temperature, the fan keeps going and the light keeps going. So with all of those things that keep going, what's it going to impact on? At the end of the month, it comes in the mail. Yes, your power bill. Okay, so it's going to be more expensive. Your power bill's going to go up. What's going to happen to the planet? As your fridge is running, compressor's going, heating up the room, Air conditioning kicks in, you're drawing on an electric, yep. Anyone know? More Using more energy, yep. Burning, maybe burning more coal, which means you're generating more, yes, in the form of carbon dioxide, which is a greenhouse gas. <laughs> We're getting there, which contributes to global warming. So it's not very efficient use of energy. Now, the household, how are they looking and feeling after the uh, fridge has been open over the long weekend? Not happy Jan. So Dad's a bit cranky because beer's not cold anymore. Uh, there's no tucker, so everyone's feeling a bit hungry. We've got a food security issue there. Now there's more work to do as well. So we've got to chuck it out, clean the fridge, the smelly fridge. Someone had a smelly fridge down there. Get out the uh, vanilla spray, give it a wipe, uh, and buy, go and buy more food. So a negative social impact, which is why we need to change the slide, which is why we need to make sure our fridge is working properly or our system is working properly. Now, what can we do to stop this happening again, this fridge being left over, left open over a long weekend? Get rid of the kids. <laughs> yep, that's one thing. But what if it was a bad seal? Fix the seal. What about the hinges on the door? Bit of maintenance? Yep. Uh, what about the temperature that it's set to? Do we need to have it on two degrees? Maybe we could have it on four degrees. So there's a bunch of things that we can do to make our generation of power and the uh, operation of our fridge more sustainable, which means we've got money to still pay the power bill, to own the fridge and to put food in the fridge and have a happy family or household. And that is the essence of sustainability, just breaking it down for you guys. And it's, off, it's, an, it's a good analogy. So then we might say, okay, sustainability, I'm hearing about it all the time, but how come? Why are we hearing about it all the time and why are consumers always getting jacked up on sustainability? Now, there's lots of reasons for it, which is actually a whole other talk. But today I will say, one of the things that we're noticing is a change in social values. People are saying to themselves, as a community in Australia and around the world, I'm tired of looking for leaders to make our lives better. We need to start doing it ourselves. So one of a, a turning point that we saw in Australia just two years ago, and in fact, I was speaking at LiveX in Perth. To, who was in Perth two years ago? Yeah, okay. So you might remember the big item that came over the news was the results of the plebiscite that we had for marriage equality. And 62% of Australians voted yes. And that was an absolute turning point in terms of our social values. The timing was right. We need to take control and work together for fairness. What else happened in 2018 that was a fairly major indictment and a call to account was the Banking Royal Commission. Did anyone follow the Banking Royal Commission? I did, and I thought how fascinating it was, how instructive and revealing it was, because the community, the business community and the federal government decided to call our banking industry to account. And I think some of the things that were real, revealed there were, were beyond frightening. Who's this bloke? Looks real happy. Zuckerberg. Yeah, Mark Zuckerberg. So there's Mark Zuckerberg, and this is him in the Senate facing a really um, difficult line of questioning about his involvement in the Cambridge, Cambridge Analytica scandal for uh, influencing the Trump election in 2016. And uh, he's recently been in a little bit more trouble. Anyone heard of Libra? 
So Facebook want to have their own uh, currency whereby you can buy and sell things through face, special Facebook currency. And this was investigated by the US Senate and uh, Sherrod Brown, who's a Democrat senator from Ohio, said, Facebook is dangerous. <laughs> Facebook is like giving a toddler a packet of matches. And every time there's an, a fire incident, they call it a learning experience. Do you really think people are going to give you their money and their bank account details? No. And that was a very important part of calling Facebook to account for reasons of privacy and ethics. And poor Mark, would he ever have thought back in the day when he wanted to rate the hotness of girls at uni <laughs> that he would end up in this place? I think not. Have anyone seen the, the film? Okay, no. All right, more likely in Australia, two groups, one's called Sleeping Giants and the other one's called Mad F-Word Witches. Has anyone heard of these groups? Very well organised groups. And their objective is to make sure that organisations who are in the business of saying things that are racist, sexist or bigoted are not profitable for those reasons. So you might have heard of 2GB, which is a radio station in Sydney, and you might have heard of Alan Jones, who is a very popular presenter there, uh, and you might have heard that he encouraged Scott Morrison to shove a sock down Jacinda Ardern's throat. Well, these two groups wrote to all of the advertisers and said, do you support this kind of language? Because if you do, I'm not buying your products anymore. I want you to stop advertising on 2GB. And guess what they did? Have a guess how many companies stopped advertising on 2GB because of these two organisations? Sorry? Most of, Most of them, exactly. It was over 50, I think closer to 80 in the end. And millions of dollars of revenue lost from 2GB because they allowed this to happen. So don't think that the social push is not potent because it absolutely is. Who's this young woman? Greta Thunberg. And she said yesterday they were trying to give her a massive prize for the environment and she declined it. She said, climate change doesn't need a prize. I don't want a prize. By the way, you're still not doing very well. <laughs> she's, very, she's a very straight talker. She was asked, are you upset because your mum, her mum's an opera singer, uh, doesn't fly around the world anymore because she doesn't agree with all the burning of the fossil fuels to take the planes. And isn't that a sad thing? And Greta said, actually, no, I don't care. She's singing locally in local opera, and that's good enough. And by the way, it's better that she's not taking planes. So she's <laughs> I thought it was funny. Anyway, she's very straight. Another group um, uh, called Extinction Rebellion Global, very well organised. And you might think, oh, just another group of, you know, civil disobedience kind of lefty people. Well, they're actually being funded by the Gettys. Might have heard of them, like one of the wealthiest families in the United States. And another family you might have heard of are the Kennedys. So high-end millionaire, billionaire types are getting behind these kinds of organisations. He needed curtains, Freddie. Yeah. So... That is driving it, that social disobedience, that want for a fairer and more equitable way of doing things. And the other big force is, of course, the consumer. And uh, we heard it just earlier. The consumer wants to know, where did this food come from? Who made it? Where was it made? And what are their values and ethics? What do they believe in? And does it align with mine? And if they don't, then I'm probably not going to buy it. All right, so being sustainable, so taking into account people, planet and profits, is actually good for business. So we have some data here. Uh, that's, I think, two years old now. Two years old. Uh, quite a... This is from Nielsen. So it's quite a respectable sample size for this one and a respectable approach to the study. You can see here that year-on-year -year sales growth with products with sustainability claims 
is actually doing particularly well. So business practices is one of them and also sustainable farming would be in the, would be in the top two. There's a group called CEDA, C-E-D-A, the Committee for Economic Development for Australia. They're a not-for-profit, they're a membership-based organisation. They have about 800 members that are Australian businesses and other uh, government departments. And their job is to make sure that Australia's economic future uh, is sound, that its social future is sound and also its environmental future. So they, did, they do uh, an annual... Uh, it's, a, it's a corporate pulse, so business pulse. And uh, they take this massive survey amongst people in businesses to understand what are the key issues going on. Now, 72% of people believe that business should place equal importance on people, planet, profit. That's quite a few people with a few shekels buying stuff. And then they look at priorities uh, for business. I don't want to go into it too deeply. You can go online. They've, it's all publicly available, CEDA, C-E-D-A. And something that's very interesting to me are millennials. What's a millennial? Under 35, yeah, more or less. So born, yeah, so the idea is you have to have been old enough to remember 9-11 is the rule of thumb. But of course, it also means that you can't have been born uh, before 1981. So I could say, hey, I'm a millennial and I'm totally not. So 1981 to uh, 1995 that sort of year, year of birth. They're saying uh, millennials believe that the top three things that should be priorities for business are the environment, ethical supply chains and work-life balance for employees. Compared with the boomers, quality products pay small businesses promptly and work-life balance for employee. So remember the millennials, there are as many millennials as there are boomers, very big, very important and potent group and many of them uh, are nearly turning 40 as well. But those views are also echoed by the next generation who are out there with the climate change, uh, school strikes, and will be voting soon and having money to spend fairly soon. Money to spend fairly soon. So 73% of millennials are willing to spend more time on sustainable products and sustainable brands than anything else than anything else. All right, so sustainability, I get it. People, planet, profits, should do it. It's good for business. But there's another kicker in sustainability. And that is a bit like justice. Justice just can't be done. Justice must be seen to be done. And that is a very important aspect of the judicial system. We have to know that justice has been done. So that is why, when you're in the business of sustainability or being sustainable, you have to behave in a sustainable way, not describe your sustainable ways. Everyone heard of um, facta non verba? Maybe it was your school motto. No? No. Actions, not words. Actions, not words. And that is very important. So let's look at some examples of where actions have actually showed a commitment to sustainability. And this was like on about the eighth or ninth page of my online Sydney Morning Herald and oh, Financial Times it was taken from. And I was really shocked that it was buried so deeply because I thought this was absolutely a highly significant thing, that the London Stock Exchange decided to reclassify oil, gas and coal to non-renewable energy. So any shares around oil, gas and coal or entities around that are now called, oh, well, you're in the non-renewable energy group now. What used to be alternative energy, solar, wind, is now called renewable energy. Words are important. And I thought this, send, this sent an extremely important message. Now, over in Germany, Angela Merkel has been working on a whole bunch of projects and one of them has been closing down its coal industry. And one thing that's been very important is that we're not sacking miners. 
That's the social and community part of sustainability. So they could be financially and environmentally sustainable, but it's not sustainable unless you've got that third leg of social. And they've been able to do that. And that's another very interesting talk and story, which I hope someone asked me to give, and I'll probably tell you even if you don't ask. I'm that person on the train, you know? Anyone who works with me will agree. Okay, so something a little closer to home. Anyone heard of the Australian Beef Sustainability Framework? No one. Yes, a few people. That's good news. So the Australian Beef Sustainability Framework has been going for nearly three years and it's an industry-led framework that identifies all of the most important priorities and indicators for Australian beef to be sustainable. And who do you think one of the biggest supporters of it is? Ron, that's right, McDonald's. And in fact, McDonald's noticed, well, they noticed, they were ecstatic, that their market share increased for the first time in about five years earlier this year because they started using fresh burgers in their quarter pounders and not frozen. Oh, right, <coughs> sustainability. So they've been very kind and lent to the Australian Beef Sustainability Framework, their value chain, their supply chain to pilot this framework. They're very committed. Uh, McDonald's also uh, with Canadian farmers and they've been partnering for some time now and they're actually, they're very serious with their ranches as they call them there. And I'm gonna show you a very short 90 second piece that illustrates why it's not a flash in the pan. Beef sustainability is way of producing food so that we aren't going to run out of the resources that we have. I mean, we've got a finite amount of resources on this planet, so we've got to use them as best we can. To produce the same pound of beef today takes 17% less water than it did 30 years ago, and it produces 15% less greenhouse gas. And so our environmental footprint is shrinking. With the same amount of feed, we can produce 20 to 25% more beef. From a sustainability point of view, it's a, uh, a much more efficient utilization of resources. And the reason those things are happening is because of a lot of technological advances. So things like better nutritional management of cattle and better health management. I think it's very exciting because McDonald's made the ask and they've stayed the course working with producers all through the value chain. So I, I, you know, I think that's really important. They've shown tremendous leadership and it's just not a flash in the pan. People are very conscious of where their food comes from. That's our job, you know, to keep good records so we can walk our talk. When I came into the McDonald's pilot project for sustainable beef in 2014 and one meeting, by the end of the meeting, I was just sold. I love the concept. I wanted to be at the front of it. I didn't want to be a follower. I wanted to be a leader. Okay, so that's from the ranchers. They understand people want to know where their food comes from and they want to take a leadership role. All right, so Meat and Livestock Australia at uh, the Grand Hyatt in Singapore is doing some very interesting work. Uh, natural fall. Has anyone heard of natural fall? Naturally falling for you? That's what they're calling the campaign. And what it is, it's the Park Hyatt buying a whole carcass and using a whole carcass. And that does a number of things. Number one, they're buying it on one fixed price per kilo, so there's some good economic reasons for that, for doing that. The other thing is they are making sure that they have a huge variety of dishes and diversity around their menu that they can create. And number three, they have a very, very nice story to tell about sustainability. They use everything that comes off the carcass. And it's also, in my mind, very respectful of the animal to say, we've raised this animal and it's died in our name for our consumption. We owe it to the animal to use it properly. It's a very powerful message. Woolworths, 
sure you know Woolworths. They have a very strong commitment to sustainability. You can see their people, planet, profit, uh, triple bottom line there. You can get online and read all about their sustainability programs. One of the most interesting things that they're doing is part of the uh, business benchmark for farm animal welfare, BBFAW, rolls off the tongue. It's a really good acronym. It's a joke, but anyway. So there are 120 organisations that participate in this annual benchmark. And the idea is you participate in the benchmark and then they classify you in tiers about how, how well you're doing specifically around animal welfare. And uh, that mostly comprises uh, food retailers. Uh, there's 40 global producers, including top 10 poultry producers, and 30 restaurants are also participating in this. And you can see uh, more organisations coming from North America and Europe compared with the rest of the world. What they saw this year was uh, 11 Chinese organisations participating in this study, and there are two in Australia. Coles and Woolworths both participate in this, and they have more takers every year to participate in the benchmark, and Coles and Woolies are in the green section there, which is some evidence of implementation. And Woolworths launched this the other well, about six months ago, because they'd moved from a tier five when they started, now they're a tier three. And they're very clear, our aim is to be tier one. And they will be. And it is a very powerful thing to be in business and be in the business of selling animal products and to be a tier one in retail and grocery. Now, talking about the effect that climate change or extreme weather has on profitability, on economics. This is something that was launched just a couple of weeks ago and you can go online and have a look at it. Combank and Westpac have come together to utilise a lot of data from many actuarial studies around projections of climate risk and how that impacts on insurability in Australia. If no further action is taken to mitigate, the impact of climate change. So if we do nothing, this is what each suburb will look like in terms of its insurability in the year 2100. Now, the dark areas there are the, the deeply uninsurable and the lighter ones are more insurable. You can get on and have a look at that. But in the end, uh, banks and insurance companies are looking at the risk around this. So we, took, look, we heard about the floods earlier this afternoon. Extreme weather like drought will be taken into consideration and who do you think is going to wear it financially? The consumer. So thinking about banking because it's quite a hot topic and certainly we had our Royal Commission in Australia. But globally, 30 banks have come together to say we should probably have some responsible banking practices. It would be a good thing to do. So they've come together and they've launched the Principles for Responsible Banking. And 130 banks have signed up, over 49 countries. Combined, they've got 47 trillion US dollars in assets. And they've all signed up to, do, to conduct themselves in this way and report on them every year. And why are they doing it? They said, because we want our business practices to align with society's goals. We want our business practices to align with society's goals. And that is why number one is alignment. But the other thing, of course, that they know is if you understand the sustainability of an organisation in which you are investing, you have a better understanding of risk. And everybody knows that if you hedge against future problems, you're going to be inherently more resilient. So their thinking is, well, if we invest in more sustainable organisations, they're more likely to survive a downturn. So am I just about finished? Yeah, she's giving me this. So three cocktail facts to take away. I liked it. Um, sustainability is a global trend that's here to stay, and I think David would acknowledge that as he said it earlier. It's not just a cycle, it's kind of here. It's going to be the norm. Um, a sustainable promise needs sustainable proof. 
Never forget that. Look up VW if you know that story. That's a cracker. Businesses that behave sustainably will win in their sector, without a doubt. And that is my talk. Except to say, don't clap yet, the challenge is real, the opportunity is great, but inaction will be costly. And this is from the Rabo guy. Yes, you can start clapping now. Thank you. <laughs>